Hi, Boan. Wanakam, greetings. Congratulations to University of Moratua for holding their research week 2021. And thanks to the organizers, especially Professor Ajit D. Alvis for inviting me. I'm sorry I cannot join you in person due to COVID-19. I'm sure that this meeting will produce important results. We are striving to achieve sustainability in the 21st century, including economic prosperity, social progress, and environmental protection. I will explain how integrated transdisciplinary methods based on the sustainomics framework and balanced inclusive green growth, BIGG, show us the way forward by applying them to both short-term problems like COVID and longer-term issues like climate change. We are all interconnected on one planet. We must unite to save the earth and ourselves. Let us act now together. Let us see how Sustainomics BIGG can help with transdisciplinary research to address sustainable development, climate change, and COVID-19, and the key role of researchers in universities. What critical problems does humanity face? There are many issues like COVID-19. There are pandemics, poverty, inequality, resource shortages, energy, water, food, financial sector collapse, conflicts, weak leadership, unsustainable values, and particularly climate change, which is the ultimate threat multiplier, worsening all other issues. Multiple threats are interrelated and synergistic, but we, the stakeholders, 7 billion people on this planet, have uncoordinated responses. There is lack of leadership at the top level. We need more decisive action by middle level leaders like city mayors and firm CEOs. We need a robust integrated strategy. Let's look at poverty and hunger in 2020. There are 800 million or more people, one in every nine, mainly in Africa and Asia who are starving. China is the exception, raised 900 million people out of poverty in the last 20 or 30 years. There are nine key global resource systems of which four are exceeding their sustainability limits. There's biodiversity, biogeochemical flows, land use, and climate change, each of which can destabilize the planetary system. Let us look at the nexus of resource limits, inequality, and poverty. There is a concept called ecological footprint of humanity, which is the sum total of uh, ecological resources that we need to sustain life on the planet and 1.5 Earths we needed equivalent in 2012 to sustain the human lifestyle. And by 2030, if we continue to consume as we are, we will need almost two Earths, which is quite unsustainable. Who is doing all this consumption? This is the infamous champagne glass, the world consumption pattern, where you can see that the richest 20 percentile consume 85% of resources, 60 to 70 times more than the poorest, 20 percentile. One percent of the richest earn, own more wealth than 99% of the rest. One percent of the richest um, emit 175 times greenhouse gases per capita than the poorest 10%. And 2,200 billionaires gained $11. trillion in 2020 in the midst of COVID-19 while billions were starving. Meanwhile, global arms expenditures also in 2020 were almost $2 trillion. So if you put those two panels together, you will see when the rich already use more than one planet, where are the resources to help the poor? So we have 75 years of unmet goals and broken promises since 1947. That was the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a very fine document. Since then, we have had many agreements. In 2015, we finally have the Sustainable Development Goals. Each one of the 17 goals 
was already in that human rights document 75 years ago. So we haven't advanced very far. We have to avoid barbarization, which is one of the risky future scenarios that I have projected. Unrestrained market forces, no ethical and moral, moral values, leading to poverty, pandemics, environmental degradation, terrorism, social polarization, resource shortages, and climate change. Total chaos and breakdown in the world. You can have a fortress world situation where the rich live in protected enclaves and the poor die miserably outside. So we don't want that kind of world. What do we need to do? What are the key concepts to move forward towards the 21st century Earth eco-civilization for a better future? I presented Sustainomics and Balanced Inclusive Green Growth, BIGG, at the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio. And they have relevance for both short-term problems like COVID and long-term issues like climate change. They can help with the implementation of the sustainable development goals. It, this has been taught widely and applied in the last 30 years. <clears throat> what is the first core concept? It says, harmonize the sustainable development triangle for balance and integration. And it also tells us a lesson for COVID, which is to protect the environment base and avoid bad feedbacks between ecological and socioeconomic systems. So you need economic prosperity to raise the poor out of poverty, but you also need to protect the environment, your natural resources, avoid pollution. And finally, you need the social side, empowerment, inclusion, and so on. And any element like COVID-19, an issue, has all three dimensions. So how do we protect the environmental base? This is a picture of how resources are deployed in the planet. You have a natural resource base at the bottom. You have economic assets, which are productive, uh, capital, labor, raw materials. And then you have the financial aggregate, stock market indices, GNP growth rates, and so on. Normally, human beings have their head in the clouds. They are watching the money trail. But we need to have our feet firmly on the ground, on the physical basis. And as long as we keep these three layers in good alignment, we have a sustainable system. But what is happening? Poor leadership is focusing too much on the financial data. It's disconnected the, with the real world. So first, you have something called environmental externalities, which is the damage caused by economic activity to the physical environment, which COVID-19 is an outcome. Climate change is another one. So you have a disconnect. For example, uh, pandemics like Ebola, SARS, MERS, even COVID are zoonoses of pathogens jumping from animals to human beings due to abuse of environment and encroachment of natural habitats. The next level, we see a further disconnect. The asset bubble, for example, in 2008, you had a property asset bubble, and which showed that these financial markets are not aligned with economic realities. And when this bubble burst, a lot of people lost their jobs and there are a lot of poverty. At the same time, there is a poverty bubble, a social bubble, which says that economic growth rates may be high, but there are still 2 billion people on the planet who are poor because of inequality. So, for example, the environmentally driven pandemic in 2020 has collapsed both social and economic systems. So, what do we do? Now, currently, human leaders have doled out many trillions of dollars to bail out rich companies and banks. About 160 billion, that is less than one-tenth of this amount, is given to help the poor as foreign aid. And for the environment, a few billion dollars. So with this, and even world military expenditures, two trillion billionaires 
uh, making $11.4 trillion. So these bubbles are driven by greed. A few enjoy now, many pay the price later, and they will suffer. So with this kind of deployment of human resources, you're not going to solve very much. What is the second core concept? It's called climb the mountain, make development more sustainable by empowering and acting. The COVID lesson is that in individual action is a powerful force. You see, sustainable development is like a mountain peak. The peak is covered with clouds. It's a bit mysterious. But if these people, we climb slowly uphill, one step at a time, we will eventually reach the top. And why? Because unsustainable activities are easy to identify. For example, when we leave the room, we switch off the light. We can turn off a running tap. We can plant a tree. We can do many things. And we can do it at the, uh, at the certainly at the individual level. COVID-19 showed that public health officials de depended on individuals and groups to use four basic time-tested methods. Avoid crowds, basic hygiene, wear masks, safe distancing. And these simple measures, without them, the global toll, 260 million cases, 5.2 million deaths, and still going on, would have been much greater. Miracle drugs and vaccines came much later. Individual action needs to be public spirit because the speed of viral transmission, high population density, interconnectivity, interdependence, vulnerability, so during a disaster like a pandemic, you cannot have greed, selfishness, and extreme competition. It is disastrous. Here are some personal choices, which I always tell my students. Harmonize yourself before trying to harmonize the earth. You have your work, income, and job satisfaction in the domain of the mind. But this is imbalanced. You need your health, fitness, good environment, OK? the body and finally you need friends community and society and the social side and this is the personal sustainable develop, develop uh, sustainability triangle you have an ethical well-balanced person with good spiritual values with a contented and sustainable lifestyle so here at the individual level you can as i said plant trees eat less, less meats do so many things I, for example, at the corporate level, you can you have corporate social responsibility pursued by many companies, sustainability accounting, triple bottom line, and so on. Now, the third core concept of sustainomics is to transcend boundaries within our own minds with innovation and fresh ideas. And the third lesson of COVID here is that you need transdisciplinary, integrated systems-based long-term analysis to solve the pandemic problem. Uh, let's look at the disciplinary issue. We need to transcend disciplines because sustainable development has many diverse issues, all the way from social justice and values to biological and physical resources. And sustainomics tells us you have to use all these disciplines, philosophy, sociology, politics, economics, engineering, natural sciences, and so on and together to solve these complex problems. The cross-disciplinary terminology. Multidisciplinary in my book means individual experts from dis different disciplines try to coordinate their efforts. Interdisciplinary work means tra a transdisciplinary team seeks to achieve a synthesis, okay? Transdisciplinarity, which is what we use in sustainomics, is an interdisciplinary team that synthesizes new concepts, methods, and models before applying them to a complex system. Here is an example of transdisciplinary spatial and temporal time analysis. This is applied to living systems. It's called the dynamic panarchy of systems. If you take a human being, for example, a living being, a hundred years lifespan, uh, maybe a two meters in size. Now it is supported at the cellular level by subsystems, which last maybe a few days or weeks, and they're sub millimeter size. And it is supporting 
a social system which is above the hum many human beings, conservation and continuity from above, innovation and adaptation from below. So the next transcend stakeholder boundaries to build cooperation. You need civil society and business working together with government, not against government, to protect the sustainable development space. This is very important. You need to avoid imbalance. For example, if you have very big business, big multinationals, they can crush civil society and government. Government, and there is no space for sustainability. This has happened in US and many large uh, Western countries. You need to integrate all policies into national sustainable development strategy. So you have to make decision makers see that the pandemic, for example, is part, and climate change are part of national sustainable development. So here are COVID and climate change. You have to reflect these into the standard sectors of the economy, energy, health, agriculture, and so on, and into natural systems, the poor communities, the vulnerable communities. Why? Because health and climate action are only one part of 17 holistic sustainable development goals. So you have to solve these holistically. The third concept is transcending boundaries with innovation and fresh ideas, as I said. And it has another lesson for COVID, refocus on social values and issues. So we need to replace unsustainable and ethical values. For example, the current model of unsustainable development is driven by unethical values. You have greed, selfishness, corruption, violence, and so on. That has led to an economic model of maldevelopment, unsustainable growth based on debt, extreme market forces, poverty, inequality, and so on. And that has caused the environmental debt. You have unsustainable pollution, depletion of natural resources. The fewer the resources you have, the more you fight over those resources. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It was for oil. In other countries, it is always for natural resources like fossil fuels and water and so on. And constantly this cycle is going on and the sustainable development space is shrinking. You need a balanced asset triangle. So you have the built capital, the buildings, the roads and the bridges. You have natural capital, air, land, and water. You have social capital, which is uh, the personal networks and the values, cultural values, the invisible glue that binds society together. This is often ignored and undervalued, and you need to integrate this for balance. Look at the role of social capital during the 2004 tsunami. I was here during the uh, first two months, the government was paralyzed. It was social capital. People who walked the beaches, cleaned up the beaches, helped the survivors. And this was a poor country, less than $1,000 per capita at the time. 35,000 people died in a matter of a few hours, one in every 500. But there was a lot of social capital to help us recover. Same thing happened in Hurricane Katrina in the US. Less than 2,000 people died, a small problem, huge per capita income of a rich country. But what happened in New Orleans? There was rape, looting, and other things. So there was no social capital. Social capital is not a function of either wealth or greatness. Learning from history. We need to see how socioeconomic and ecological systems have who in evolved. There is the decline of civilizations in the sense that Chinese, the Han civilization, the Maurya and the Gupta in India, Mesopotamia in the Middle East, Roman in Italy. These lasted for thousands of years, but eventually they collapsed because of a combination of environmental and social factors. There was overconsumption of resources which destroyed the environment and there was division into rich elites and poor masses, social polarization. 
So let's see how environmental and social factors combine to cause instability now. This is the environmental base of this champagne glass where the poor are the stem, the thing, the rich are in this part of the curve. If you have a disaster like COVID, this glass is unstable. It tips the glass over because the base is very narrow. Green growth, which I will show you, is to make the environmental base bigger so that the glass becomes more stable. So you have both environment and economy. And balanced inclusive green growth tells you you have environment, you have more less inequality, better distribution of income, and this is much more stable. And this is called balanced inclusive green growth. That's how you stabilize society. The fourth core concept is implement, implement, implement. Enough with the talk. We have to pursue a transformative path to sustainability by implementing via BIGG. There are many case studies and best practice examples of the application of analytical tools. Please contact me if you want to uh, find out more details. Now, let's talk about the BIGG. What urgent changes do we need to save the global system? Here I have plotted greenhouse gas emissions, which is per capita greenhouse uh, uh, gas uh, the climate risk. Here is the economic development level, which is per capita income. The triangle here, economy, society, and environment, is not balanced, which is why you have a red X. The poor countries are here, low economic output, but also low emissions. Rich countries are up here, they are rich, but they are emitting well above the safe limit. And middle countries are somewhere in between. Now, the first step, which I said is green growth, balancing economy and environment, is that the rich countries can transform their economies. They can have the same quality of life, economically improved, but with reduced consumption of natural resources because we have the technologies to save energy, to save water and materials and so on. Similarly, these middle countries have another approach, which is instead of following the wasteful profligate path of the rich, they use the green growth tunnel and countries like Sri Lanka would like to follow balance economy environment for green growth using integrated transdisciplinary methods. And the third step is balance inclusive green growth where you balance all three. How do you do that? You bring in poor, poor pro poor inclusive policies into green growth. Then you make it be balanced inclusive green growth and <clears throat> these countries can reach the same point as the rich countries eventually in a BIGG path. Now, let me talk briefly about how digital technology can guide us to the 21st century. Digital technology can help us achieve this global vision by focusing on gross national happiness and well-being not only material growth or GDP. I have worked with the Kingdom of Bhutan on this. This we can do if we follow the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is our last chance, a universal integrated model, leaving no one behind. And it is a monitoring framework that must be adapted to each country's needs. Digital technology here is under nine innovation and infrastructure, but it's linked to all the other goals. Just a personal anecdote, I believe in digital technology because I helped to create the first computer policy for Sri Lanka in 1982, and also was the first chairman of Syntec a long time ago. If you look at Moore's law, you will see that there's a logarithmic relationship between performance and time, and it is still holding. I look at my personal experience, it mirrors that. As a Cambridge University undergraduate in 1964, I was still using slide rule, uh, log tables. Uh, I punched 
tape to run an old computer called EDSAC to program it to autocode. If you punch one whole, whole row, you have to re-punch the whole tape, several feet of it. <laughs> As a MIT physics graduate student in the 1970s, I used punch cards, Fortran, running IBM 36070 mainframe, which I used to run personally. As a professional in 1980, I got my Radio Shack mini computer, small, 48K. I had a hand calculator. As a professional in the 1990s and 2000s, a full range of digital technologies, laptops, internet, smartphones, AI cloud, and so on. What are the impacts of digital technology on sustainable development? First, there are social gains. You have more employment, increased participation, but also risks, exclusion of poor and increasing inequality. And it could be used for destructive purposes like for terrorism. Environmental gains, more efficient production and better pollution management, but also risks. For example, more consumerism means more pollution and e-waste itself, disposal, is pollution producing. And there are, of course, economic gains, more productivity and growth, but you can, the risk is you can widen the gap with rich and poor, more risk of instability. So you have to mind the risks when you pursue these new technologies. Now, let's look at sustainable consumption under BIGG. This is a rich family, food for a week. They can have the same well being, but with less packaging and less waste. One third of the world's food production is wasted, mainly in homes in the USA and Europe, while 800 million people are starving. So this is this part of the curve. Now, what about the poor family here? Look at their meager food supply. We need to raise them out of poverty on this part, uh, along the BIGG part, so that we eliminate poverty and inequality and behave more ethically. BIGG also uses innovative methods. In 2012, at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, I formed a group of international musicians who were on the beach with me. Uh, we got tired of listening to the empty promises of the leaders on, in the main podium. And we formed Sustaino Musica, which is the International Consortium of Musicians and Music Labels who are making the music of sustainability that will appeal to the heart, especially millions and millions of young people who are attending rock concerts and other things, because music and song are sometimes much better to appeal to the emotions rather than this kind of lecture, which appeals only to a few people in a closed auditorium. Then you have sustainable production, which is also part of the. I've talked to the business leaders of multinational senior managers and CEOs, and they all agree that sustainability and triple bottom line is the way to the future. But they also agree that resource efficiency is a win win starting point. I'll show you why because you can save resources, increase your profits, but also protect the environment. Finally, ethical values are keys to long-term sustainability, third lesson. And all these companies, for example, BASF is the biggest chemical company in the world. Tesco, giant supermarkets, look at these retail firms. OPEC, oil and gas, Petrobras, Syme Darby, plantation conglomerate, biotech conglomerate, mining, heavy industry, wine producers. All of these I have lectured to, and they all agree on these points. Sustainable production, this is a win-win option. If you take a life cycle value chain analysis, which is now a standard tool, you look at raw material production, manufacturing, logistics, retail, consumer, recycling, and disposal. If you look at T, which we have analyzed in Sri Lanka, 47%, for example, of carbon dioxide emissions happens in retail. Why? Because the packaging is very heavy. So if they streamline the packaging, they can reduce their carbon footprint very much so. That is the hotspot. 
you have orange juice that is transported from the Brazil to the UK, it's transport, transport by ship. So if they make this more efficient, they can reduce the carbon footprint. If you look at milk that is produced in the UK, 76% of emissions happens within the farmhouse. So you have to here educate the farmers. And garments in Sri Lanka, again, 65% of emissions happens in the raw material because it's embedded in the product. So if you procure carefully, you can reduce the emissions footprint. Same analysis can apply to energy, water, and land. Now the COVID lesson six is that sustainable markets can be created with the help of digital technology and lifestyles. See, if you put sustainable consumers and sustainable producers together, they can be few, but they form a sustainable cycle. And eventually if that behavior, good behavior spreads throughout uh, society, traditional markets for oil, like polars, online markets for youth, then you can develop a sustainable uh, society. And that is what mine and the University of Water Tour should be doing. Now, let me talk briefly about IPCC. This is summary of some key findings of theirs. I've worked with them for more than 20 years. Global warming is proven. Human uh, emissions are the cause of the problem. In the future, climate change will cause great and irreversible harm, and the poor will suffer the most. This is very unfair. It is unjust. You need to integrate climate change into sustainable development strategy. That's the solution. And even the IPCC had to evolve in its thinking. When I first joined at the beginning, before 2000, it was dominated by physical scientists and they thought climate and development are completely separate. But with a small group of developing country scientists, we worked within and we came to this, we showed that climate and development are closely linked and you can have an integrated climate change sustainable development strategy. This is the current viewpoint. And in fact, the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the IPCC for this insight. I was vice, vice chair of the IPCC at the time. Now, these are the two way climate development links that we follow. There is a sustainable development domain where our past development parts have caused greenhouse gas emissions, which has disturbed the atmosphere through a process of radiative forcing and buildup of concentrations. And the climate strikes back, it imposes stresses on human and natural systems through temperature, sea level rise, and precipitation change. And because of those stresses, our development parts must change. Now, there are two human interventions. First is called mitigation, which you all know. We try to squeeze down the emissions by reducing uh, greenhouse gases. The other one is called adaptation, which is we try to squeeze down the impacts so that human and natural systems are not disturbed so much. And we try to break this. So this is the cycle and how do you break them? Look at climate change risks and uh, vulnerability of cities. Temperature rise, extreme weather. This is Zhangzhou in China in July of this year. Look at these clouds. These are floating like dead fish. Why? One year's worth of rain fell in three days, overwhelmed their flood defenses. This is Lytton, Canada. You had record breaking high temperatures also in July 2021. This is the town before, this is the morning afterwards. Completely burned to the ground, small town, because of high temperatures. So we must build future cities to be sustainable and climate resilient because the world is urbanizing very fast. Future sustainable cities, if they are well planned, they are more resilient reduce harm to human lives and biodiversity. They will be cooler, lower climate change impacts, reduce air pollution, reduce risk from water and vector-borne diseases, better energy management, 
lower damage all around. Now, I'll talk to you about climate justice. This is a case of not penalizing the poor who are already hammered by climate change. This is a case of sustainable energy prices. See, to meet the economic goal we try, which is maximizing growth, we raise prices. This is called economic efficiency. And you raise prices to reflect long run incremental costs because energy costs, for example, oil prices and other things may be rising. Now, environmental protection, this is green energy. Why? You raise prices a little bit more so that uh, environmental damage can be compensated. This is called internalizing, for example, air pollution taxes and so on. This is the green growth tunnel. Then you come to social equity and you see that meeting economic and environmental goals is not enough because raising prices will be deprive the poor of basic energy and only the rich can afford it. So this is not correct. So you need block pricing structures, which we all know for electricity, low lifeline prices to help the energy poor. And therefore you balance the triangle. And this is the BIGG part, the equitable, uh, inclusive and green growth part. Now let's look at sustainomics BIGG applications to projects. I've taken some hydro projects that are mitigating carbon emissions. This is an example of transdisciplinary analysis. It's about 15 years old, but very relevant. We used engineering, mathematics, computer science, water, hydrology, ecology, economics, the whole range of disciplines. It took more than a year, and I'm going to summarize for you in two minutes or less. This is an overview of the study. Energy affects all three dimensions of sustainability. We pick three variables, just three, to measure damage per ton of carbon avoided. Why? Because when you generate electricity with hydro, you uh, displace fossil fuels and you reduce emissions. The economic variable is the supply cost, very simple. The social variable, number of people displaced because some of these sites had dams which flooded villages. Environmental is biodiversity loss indicator because land gets flooded. Now, what are the results? This is a plot for 21 different sites in Sri Lanka, by the way. You see this bar chart. The first is the cost. The second bar is the dis re resettlement of people. The third one is the biodiversity loss, independently measured. Now, if you look at this bar chart, you can't really make a decision. A decision maker will uh, throw you out of the room if you take this one. So you have to replot, okay? And this is the multi-criteria analysis, a three-dimensional plot. Cost is that way, people resettle this way, biodiversity loss into the paper, right? Now, these points are all bad, why? Right? You have high economic cost, large number of people resettled, high biodiversity source. So these are lose-lose options and you can forget them. These ones that are closest to the origin are the best sites because low economic cost, low number of people resettled and low biodiversity loss. It's a neat way of visualizing. Now I'll show you about BIGG at the na national level how you apply integrated transdisciplinary analysis. In 2017, Sri Lanka President Sirisena fulfilled his UN pledge made two years before by appointing a presidential expert committee to write this report. So this is the Sustainable Sri Lanka 2030 Vision and Strategic Path. I happen to be the chairman. So, we had 40 Sri Lankan experts, no foreign experts. If we looked at the three clusters, economic, social, and environmental. We looked at all the sectors that are important, agriculture, energy, uh, and so on. And we looked at a whole lot of cross-cutting issues. For example, citizenship and values, climate, gender, poverty, youth perspective, and so on. And how did we 
pursue this. This is not a political document. It's practical and solution oriented and can be used by any government in power in the future. I, it is on my website, you can download it, it at any point. And we were aiming for this by 2030, Sri Lanka hopes to become a sustainable upper middle income Indian Ocean hub with an economy that is prosperous, competitive and advanced, an environment that is green and flourishing and a society that is inclusive, harmonious, peaceful and just. We will follow the middle path based on BIGG. So here is our main thing. Thriving economy, not poor, green environment, and an inclusive society. How did we do it? Well, we started with the three aggregates, economy, environment, and society. And we tried to show the interactions between three, these three main aggregates. This is the first step. For example, we looked at how economic growth is harming environment and society and how we can stop that. Secondly, we looked at the sectors and how the sectors in, interact with economy, environment, and society, and how the sectors interact with each other. Okay, this one, for example, transport affects agriculture and food prices, linked to energy, urban and physical planning and so on. And in the next step, we looked at how the cross-cutting themes affect the economy, environment, and society. For example, climate and air quality will affect agriculture, and food, transport, and water resources. It will also affect gender, vulnerable people, poverty, and inequality. So there are a lot of interactions and that report looked at all the interactions. Okay, we also looked at how spatial integration works across central government, provinces, and districts, and Pradesh here, Sabahman, using the subsidiarity principle, which says that always pass down the decisions to the lowest level where it can be implemented effectively. Finally, let me tell you, we need to watch out for potential surprises because the climate change, the ultimate risk multiplier, you have pandemics like COVID, resource shortages, social unrest and conflicts, economic crises, and also technological disruption. But innovative thinking, like you researchers, will build resilience to help us survive in a dynamically changing world. Here are 12 potentially economic disruptive technologies that I have listed. The first eight are all digital technologies. So let me tell you that although I'm also a fan of digital technology, uh, it's all not all roses. We have to be careful about the risks. So I have an optimistic final message for Sri Lanka and the world. We have multiple interlinked global problems. It's a serious challenge for us all, pandemics, economic crisis, poverty, resource scarcity, conflict, climate change, and so on. These problems can be solved together with transdisciplinary research if they begin now. Sustainomics and BIGG show us the, the way to make development more sustainable, one step at a time. Governance systems at all levels must be transformed to deal with multiple crises in an integrated holistic way. We have to manage the post-COVID recovery to support sustainable development, business and civil society. We must support government, sometimes even push government to do the right thing. And I think University of Moratua researchers can lead in devising 21st century paths for sustainable development in Sri Lanka and the world. Let me end by remembering a little bit our past. It's an ancient Pali blessing. May the rains come in time, which is the environment. May the harvest be bountiful, which is the economy. May the people be happy and contented. May the king be righteous, which is society. So many hundreds of years ago, 
our ancestors knew about the sustainable development triangle. We, and especially I am rediscovering it today. The Munasinga Institute for Development makes development more sustainable, we hope. We have awards and scholarships and many of the moratorium students have benefited from that. We have applied research on sustainability. We engage in public policy. We have many publications. Go to my website, research website, and you can access many of them. And I say stuti, nandri, thank you.